Good morning, everybody. Thank you for showing up uh, this early. I know you've got a lot of other things going on, but my name is Cole Masters. I work for NRG Energy. We are the largest independent power producer in the country. Um, so we run power plants all over the country. Um, kind of my background is I've been working for over 10 years uh, in various different power plants. Now my official title is sourcing specialist. It's kind of like once well, at my day job, but um, forestry and uh, home lawn care equipment throughout the world. Uh, my specific role in the company is uh, working in our operator station group, and I've been involved in developing the interface between the machine and the and the operator for about the last 20 years or so. So it's been a very interesting uh, journey to see all the changes that have happened as we brought uh, new technology into the into that product. I can talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, my degree is actually in engineering science, which was uh, one of those, when I went to college, I thought, I really don't know what I want to do. So I went to this, took, I, I went to Iowa State, and there was a degree called engineering science, which had a little bit of everything. So it was awesome, because you get to learn a lot of stuff about many different things, and it worked out really well for me. So that's my uh, my day job. My my uh, non-day job is, uh, well, I'm a mentor for a first robotics team that, that happens to be here, so we're enjoying that time as well. I've been doing that for a long time since my son was uh, in high school back in uh, 2001, so I've been, had a chance to do that and enjoyed that for a long time. So uh, Sarah asked about our most innovative thing, and you know, there's, I, I don't know, there's so many things you work on over a long time, but I have to say, the thing that, that maybe influenced me the most in that is when I grew up, I, I grew up on a, a fairly small Iowa farm. And, you know, if you grow up on a farm, you learn to do everything. Because you don't take stuff to town, you do it yourself. You get a welder, you get all the stuff, you just fix it yourself. And so I think, I think there we really learned to be innovative in everything we did. You know, my parents brought me up that way and all the other kids, we just learned to do all the stuff ourselves. And so I think you, you learn innovation through, um, through actually doing things that way. Hi, my name's Ross Wilcox. I'm a mechanical engineer at uh, Rockwell Collins. We make electronics. Most electronics we make flies. About half of it's military, half of it's commercial. So if you flew here, we had one of our boxes was undoubtedly in the electronics bay of your airplane. Um, I've been, in, been there for 18 years. I work at Advanced Technology Center, which is the research and development group. Most I work on uh, thermal management, electronics cooling, <coughs> and packaging of, you know, of micro microelectronics. Um, the most innovative thing, I was trying to, most of the stuff I do is pretty incremental, it seems like, but I mean, kind of following with what you were saying about, you know, I also grew up in a farm, and my dad was the type who would try to overhaul the tractor with nothing but a fencing pliers and a can opener. And, um, and I think I've kind of taken, I, I realized that after years of doing a lot of spreadsheet analysis, I do a lot of innovative, weird things with spreadsheets that are, like, I'm sure, Microsoft would approve of because it's like you use your three tools you figure out and uh, so kind of using the tools you have available here that's one of the innovative things I've done. So sorry about that. I am alert. I'm Eric Drucker. I'm the director for Booz Allen Hamilton's data science solutions business. So what we do is we find that a lot of our clients have challenges um, in learning how to use code or scripts like R and Python. And so what we do is we essentially build tools that will translate their natural language queries directly into R and Python code that can then run on huge data sets. And we do this for clients such as all the intelligence agencies, um, a bunch of different energy companies, as well as for the International Space Station. So I can certainly talk a little bit more about that later. Um, my background is in applied mathematics. I've got a degree from William and Mary, so drive. Um, but I've also been programming since I was eight. So I started back in QBasic. Um, I don't even know if do you guys ever heard of DOS. I feel like this is like the, the okay, this is like the 2000. Are we ourselves? Yeah, it's the 2000 teens version of asking if you ever have heard of Fortran. Um, but I think the most innovative thing that I've ever done, it'll be the story that I share with you guys today, is I was working on NASA's James Webb Space Telescope program, and we had a type of simulation that we were running that we had to run on a daily basis that took about 14 hours to run. It was making all of our lives miserable. So I took a couple weeks off work, I bought a laptop, I went into my basement, and I wrote an algorithm that was able to compress those simulations from 14 hours to about a tenth of a second. And now, uh, about six years later, it's a $60 million a year business within New Zealand. Um, so that's one of the things I'll be sharing with you guys today. Thanks. Uh, 
of how you can sort of go from having this problem and, and this idea to actually turning it into something sort of really big and cool that other people get to participate in. So thanks again for coming today, guys. I know it's early and it's impressive to see you guys here right now. Thanks, Eric. All right, so we're going to kick it back to Juan to tell the United States Patent and Trademark Office innovation story. Great. So, so at the U U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, uh, USPTO for short, um, we're tasked with issuing patents and to inventors and registering trademarks for business owners, as well as advising the administration and the president on intellectual property uh, policy. So coming from the USPTO standpoint, we, uh, we call ourselves the innovation agency. Right, because all, all these awesome things that these engineers are doing and, uh, and these companies are creating, they're coming to us to protect those ideas. Right? So it, it's, a, it, it's actually one of the only federal agencies that is protected in the Constitution. Right? Think about that. How many federal agencies are there? There's lots. And we're like one of two that actually our forefathers thought to build into the Constitution because that's how important they thought your ideas were, that you should be able to protect those ideas. So we're the place that you go to to do that. So in, in saying that, from a global perspective, um, the patent office started out small. You know, the first patent examiner was actually uh, Thomas Jefferson, right? And uh, now we have 10,000 patent examiners. We, uh, there's over hundreds, so there's like three, 400, 500,000 patent applications filed a year, right? So you go from one patent examiner and then all these ideas that, that you share with other people, right? And they come to us for protection, but by sharing those ideas, then other people get to re look at your ideas and improve upon it, right? So those 10,000 patent examiners have hundreds of applications in their dockets. So if you think about that, from a quality standpoint, we have to, we have to be innovative in the way that, that we process these patent applications, right? So, we have 13,000 employees, 10,000 are patent examiners alone, but those other 3,000 employees are on the back end. They're either scanning the patent applications, making sure every word is correct so that when they get to the patent examiner, they, they understand what they're doing. So these patent examiners have to be high tech, we need engineers and scientists, all right? So if you want to come work for us, we need people who understand these drawings. And, and so just the, 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 the mechanism, the machine that makes our, our agency tick has to be innovative. We're constantly looking at ways to improve the efficiency of our process. All right, patent examining is it's kind of like a production job, right? You have to examine a certain amount of patent applications every couple of weeks. Well, how can we make that more efficient? Because there's a backlog. Uh, I don't know if you know, but there's a backlog of maybe 12 to 18 months. So if you file a patent application today, it's not gonna get picked up for 18 months. How's that make you feel? Not very happy, right? Especially if you have a business who's relying on that intellectual property, that protection to go out to the marketplace and sell that, right? You don't have 18 months to sit and wait to, to know if you're going to be able to protect that invention. So it's our job to, to make that process more efficient for, for the public, for you. So we're constantly thinking of ways to make that better. So we need creative people. We need people who, who know computers. We need people who know the, um, the this, this Financials, right? Because there's a lot of money coming in. And by the way, another another tip of information: uh, your tax money does not pay my salary. We are totally fee funded. So, so if you file a patent application, thank you because you're helping us sustain what we do. Um, so that's that's like a kind of a global aspect. There's so many different uh, avenues that we need to help the, the, the PTO keep running and keep being the number one intellectual property agency in the world that we are. Um, from a patent examining standpoint, I spent 12 years examining patent applications. Um, so, I'm a mechanical engineer and I need to understand technical drawings because if you've ever read a patent, you understand that it's, it's, not, it's not like reading a, a children's story, <laughs> right? So, I, I needed to be creative in what I'm reading. I needed to be able to, to quickly analyze and understand the technical, the technical information that was coming through um, that application and I needed to be able to go out into the world and, and, and search for it. And, and a lot of times, if you ever work with patent attorneys, they, they're a little tricky, right? They try to trick you. They try to use words that make you think like you're looking for something else, when really, you know, their, their, their invention is, is another thing. So you need to be creative in the way that you apply language to, to whatever it is you're looking for. Um, so I spent 12 years kind of back and forth, it's like the cat and mouse game with attorneys, going back and forth, figuring out what the invention is, and really just truly giving them protection on what it is that their invention is. Um, and that's, that's from that standpoint. And I think, personally speaking, um, 
innovation to me is, is not, it's not the end goal. It's not, it's not where you're going, but it's how you get there, right? So, so for instance, my innovation story was, was being an educator, right? I didn't grow up wanting to educate. In fact, I didn't really, to be honest with you, I wasn't super huge on kids to begin with um, in, in my earlier parts of life, right? I, to be honest, I was like, yeah, I have little nephews and they can go play in the sand and that's cool, you know? Um, but slowly, as I went into my career, I realized how important tech not like just, just knowledge is, right? And then I would see the, the a student's mentality as they're younger is totally different than us as adults, right? And I, and I just love that creativity that, that kids have and just piquing their curiosity, right? So I, so I just went to a school, third grade session one day, and we did a rockets, we built rockets, talking about Newton's third law. And that was in 2008. And then I just kept going back to the school. Like every two weeks, we'd go back and work with third graders, we'd work with fourth graders. And I did that for six years, volunteering, thousands of hours, creating lesson plans, not even realizing that I was actually changing careers. Like, and, and so now I do it full time. I don't, I don't have a job, I tell people. I get paid to do what I love, right? And, and that's, that's innovation, it's, it's just it's a mindset. It's a way of attacking problems and, and finding solutions. Um, don't be afraid to, to communicate. Diversify, diversity of thought is, is, a, is a good thing. Um, so it's the way you get there, it's not, it's not the end goal, right? So if you just practice, practice traits, get good at, at thinking a certain way and a certain methodology, then innovation will find you. You know, you, know, you won't necessarily find innovation. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's what happens. So. Thank you, Warren. That was, that was excellent. Definitely want to say hello to the cheese heads back there. I like the hats. Thanks for coming, guys. <laughs> Anyway, like I said, my name is Cole. Um, work for NRG Energy. Um, so, kind of as an energy industry, we're we're kind of in a issue right now, right? Everybody wants clean electricity, but they don't want the lights to go out either. So we're pretty reliant on fossil fuels and that sort of thing. Um, I worked at a large coal plant for the first eight years of my career, or six years. Um, showing up every day, looking at it, and you sit in the parking lot and you can kind of see the smoke coming out of the stack. Something just doesn't feel right. So you look around and you're like, well, we've been doing this electricity thing for 100 years, but it hasn't really changed yet, has it? Does anybody agree with that? There you go. So, you know, where does innovation come into that? And that's where you guys come into play. Right? I'm already in the industry. I'm kind of getting older now. Doesn't look like it. Got a baby face. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, we need you guys to come out with new ideas to make this renewable energy uh, industry sustainable, long-lasting, uh, not intermittent, which is something we're running into a lot. Um, I got my opportunity to be a, a part of uh, this plant we call Ivan Paul. Um, like I said, they're the largest, uh, or world's largest solar thermal power plant in the world. Um, it was kind of interesting when I showed up there. It was, I was a little scared, not going to lie. Um, didn't really know how it would fit in. There were 2,500 people showing up every day on the job site to uh, take this project from a kind of concept right out of the sand and, and try to build it up in the middle of the desert. So you can imagine over that time, you know, everybody had some pretty good concepts of how this thing was going to come together. There were tons of drawings and tons of ideas and, and plans in place, but until you really get into the middle of it, into the meat of it, you don't necessarily know if it's going to work or not, right? This was a project that had scaled up 10 times from the concept of, from the smaller projects that had been done around the world. So it, everybody was pretty confident, but you know, you're never 100% confident. It's just like you guys starting out on January, I think it was 2nd this year, right? Night? Excuse me. A week early. Um, you saw the video, right, and saw what you had ahead of you, and you had some pretty good ideas, I'm sure. Um, some pretty good confidence from years past and experience, but you didn't know exactly how it was going to work. And then what happened? You all kind of got in the same room, you had your ideas, you had your drawings, you had your parts, you started putting them together, and then what happened? Anybody? You had that oh no moment that you 
had this idea, you were putting it together, and it's not going to work, right? Anybody else run into that? There's a few hands. Thank you for participating. Um, so the same thing happens out there at, at, at the project I worked on. Um, 